CEO and the Editor-in-Chief at The Wrap. We're really happy to have you here for our 2020 and 2021 awards and international screening series. This time, we're gonna have a Q&A for The Dissident, a documentary that we are really excited to bring to you today. Just in general, just know that we are going to be bringing you many more titles, many more conversations throughout this year's extended awards season, all of it streaming online. So look out for invitations to those and be sure you're invited to all our future events. If you're not on our list today and you want to join, you should check out our membership sign up page on Rap Pro, which is just go to the Rap Home page and click on Rap Pro. So we're gonna kick off today's event with a trailer from The Dissident, and then we'll go right into our conversation with filmmaker Brian Fogel. And then we will conclude the event with an audience Q&A, so, uh, so you can queue up your questions uh, and post them in the live chat right next to the screen. Uh, so let's start out and see a trailer from The Dissident. My name is Hatice Cengiz. I am addressing you as a victim. A title forced on me after the brutal murder of my Jamal. Jamal Khashoggi, prominent Saudi journalist and Washington Post columnist, has gone missing after visiting his country's consulate in Istanbul. He was last seen entering Saudi Arabia's consulate seeking paperwork to marry his fiancée. His fiancée saw him go in at 1 p.m. and was still waiting for him at 1 a.m. Saudi Arabia now suddenly is admitting that Hashoggi did die inside that building. Jamal Khashoggi, alelade bir şekilde öldürülmemiştir. The government treated me as if I shot the king. We knew that they would try to sweep the whole thing under the rug. Is it true that Turkish intelligence obtained audio recordings of Khashoggi's murder? I know why Jamal was killed. It's because of me. Birileri tüm olup biteni rahatlıkla seyretmiş, hatta talimatlar vermiş olabilir. Save some particularly damning piece of the puzzle, like Saudi body double. Jamal felt the whole country was against him, but this is not the truth. Said the best solution is create our own army. The king firmly denies any knowledge of it. These could have been rogue killers. Who knows? I just have seen this. Be careful. Move from city to another one. And there's a team is going to kill you soon. It's anonymous. He has to be held in a way that will send the message to everyone else. Because if you think you're out of this status, who else you cannot kill? You can kill everyone. Allah and Jamal. Once you start working with us, you're not just a journalist. You are a dissident. What do you know about the peace? director of this film, Brian Fogel. He's an Academy Award-winning director for Icarus and also a 2017 Sundance Film Festival Special Jury Prize winner. He also has an Edward R. Murrow Award for Journalism and has been nominated for the BAFTA, three Emmys, and a DGA Award for Best Direction. Welcome, Brian. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sharon, for the warm intro. Uh, pleasure to be here. 
Yeah. So for our viewers who don't know, uh, Brian and I spent some time where when the film premiered, uh, I got to interview him and one of the subjects in the film, Hadija, the fiance of Jamal Khashoggi. Um, and it was a very um, powerful and moving interview for me, Brian, and your film at the time. Um, I, I know I knew then it was a very important film and I'm so glad that you're gonna get to share it with the world soon. <laughs> me too, me too. Um, just for our viewers, the film is going to be out in theaters on December 25th and then it'll be available for streaming. Um, so that's great. And of course, uh, those who signed up for this screening were able to see it in advance, which we love to share it with our uh, insider audience. This is a very important film. Um, as a journalist, uh, no matter how many times I see uh, the trailer or the film, and I just rewatched the film, and I did get to go to the premiere at Sundance, which was extremely intense. Um, and as somebody who started out as a foreign correspondent in the Middle East, it fills me with rage, <laughs> I will just tell you. Um, and uh, so I would just start by asking, what drew you to this topic, having come off of your uh, Academy Award for Icarus about uh, drug drugging in the Olympic sports world, uh, also an incredible film, and, and most of us probably have already seen it, but it's a very different, very, very different topic. Well, you know, uh, having went through that journey of Icarus, which ultimately led to me uh, literally protecting a, a whistleblower, uh, having Gregory Rachenkov arrive in the United States with nothing more than a, a backpack and a carry-on, um, and then myself and my team uh, navigating, uh, you know, these uh, myriad of pitfalls to bring his story forward to the world and then ultimately protect him guide him into federal uh, protective uh, custody where he remains, um, and then bring that story to the world that resulted in Russia being banned from the 2018 uh, Pyeongchang Olympic Games. And had the Olympics uh, happened this last summer, Russia uh, appeared that they would uh, be banned yet again for um, uh, fabricating Gregory's evidence. Um, that it, it it led me to want to continue um, my work as a filmmaker uh, to take on stories that involved human rights, that involved freedom of press, freedom of journalism, where I could be a filmmaker, but that I could also be an activist uh, behind these stories and um, and get involved in in a way that perhaps. Um, uh, many storytellers would otherwise not look to be uh, involved. And uh, after Icarus, I was looking for that next story. I was looking for that next film that that I wanted to make. And at the same time, I I felt a I guess I would I would call it a, a burden, um, and that I wanted to make sure that my next project um, had that weight that I felt uh, Icarus had in being able to affect real world change that in being able to hopefully change lives uh, of people um, uh, and hopefully for the better. And as the murder of Jamal unfolded uh, in the media um, in the month of October, um, leading to Saudi Arabia, I believe on October 16th or 17th, finally admitting that Jamal had in fact died inside that consulate. So we're, um, for my people, was, we're talking 2018, so we're almost exactly. Yes, two almost two years. years. Mm -hmm. um, um, as I d started to dig into it, it, it checked all these boxes for me. It was a story of, of a Washington Post journalist, a Saudi journalist, uh, who was a moderate, who was advocating for freedom of speech, freedom of press in his country, mm -hmm. believing that his country could be better. Um, not a revolutionary, uh, you know, a moderate. There was there was a story of, of human rights and Omar Abdelaziz in Canada that was emerging in the days following Khashoggi that had been hacked using uh, Israeli cybersecurity software Pegasus. And in hacking Omar and hacking Jamal, 
Um, Omar believed that he was one of the reasons why they murdered Jamal um, and that his brothers and friends are still sitting in a Saudi prison. Um, there was the love story between Jamal and Hatija and uh, the unfathomable loss uh, to someone that you believe that you're going to marry to have them never exit uh, outside that consulate with those marriage documents that he had went in to receive. And all these elements, you know, to me felt like um, was a story that I wanted to dive into. And the question became is, could I gain that access and trust? Right, exactly. Hadija and Omar and the Turks and the Washington Post to craft the film and the story that was not going to be archival news and that was going to truly be um, the story, or as I kind of thought of it as the untold story behind the murder of Jamal. Yeah, that's, that's a great background. I really want to just recap for our viewers and our listeners the just the short version of what happened here because it never loses its ability to shock, which is that a Saudi uh, national, Jamal Khashoggi, was living in Washington, D.C. in exile, writing reformist and critical journalism about the country that was his native country where he spent many years working close to the royal family, travels to Istanbul to get paperwork to marry his fiance who is a Turkish woman. And he goes into the embassy and in that embassy, he is murdered by a squad of people sent from Saudi Arabia on private planes that belong to the, to the government uh, murdered, suffocated, I'll say, because you that becomes clear in your film. And then, as we now know, dismembered and removed from the embassy in pieces. And it is such a still, it is such a, it is such a small thing because it's one man, and it, yet it is one of the most shocking stories I've ever heard in a lifetime of seeing shocking films and documentaries and reporting on them myself. And... Um, Saudi Arabia, let me just remind everyone, is an ally of the United States. So you did get quite a lot of access, Brian, and you did uh, succeed in digging up things that we did not know um, without wanting to give the whole film away because many people watching probably haven't seen it yet. Let's talk a little bit about the things that you were able to get access to and the things that you um, didn't expect to learn that you were able to to learn and share share with the world. Well, um, I, I think I think uh, that that encapsulates it pretty well, Sharon. I mean, w w the world knows of the story of Jamal walking into a consulate to be murdered and dismembered. Um, but I, I felt that there was and is a story that is still not. Um, been told. And what the film contains is, um, I guess I would call it a, a treasure trove of new information, detailed information, uh, and uh, an evidence, which is still uh, to this day, and uh, you know, as the film gets released, um, has not come forward. Um, among these items are uh, Tur the Turkish voice, the Turks uh, who examined uh, the crime and the murder uh, and have been involved in the prosecution of that murder. Um, and all the interviews in the film from Irfan Fidas, the chief prosecutor, Abrahimi Gul, the justice minister, Faratan Altun, uh, President Erdogan's spokesperson, uh, and Recep, the uh, CSI police examiner, uh, none of them have ever uh, appeared on camera or sat for an interview uh, before. Um, so that is uh, really uh, uh, the inside story. Um, the transcript of Jamal's murder, um, uh, Turkey released uh, little pieces of it, uh, but still to this day have never uh, released that transcript. Um, 
to the media. Um, it's in the hands of the CIA, British intelligence, the French, uh, and the Turks. Um, and uh, they provided that full transcript uh, to me uh, in order uh, to weave that story and the details of what happened uh, to him uh, to, in making the film. Uh, so that is uh, exclusive to the film, as well as the Turkish police footage from inside of the consulate and the uh, consul general's home, um, as well as the audio from Omar Abdelaziz of the Saudi rendition team that had come to Canada uh, to basically try to rendition Omar uh, back to Saudi and those recorded messages. And then, of course, there's tons of personal uh, archives from uh, Jamal and Hatija and their messages between each other, their text messages, the text messages between Jamal and Omar, um, and the list kind of goes on. So, um, you know, this really is uh, the story behind the story, and um, and there's so much in the film that just um, uh, ha has yet to actually be seen. I will also point out that... Um you're an extremely inconvenient person to be around for the Saudi Arabian government. Um, they had a really good friend in President Trump, probably still new, and they have had major ambitions to bring investment to the to the country. I mean, I, I continually come across people who've just been to uh, some state-sponsored visits. Still now, people still going to this uh, incredible, like, I wouldn't say it's like a Las Vegas type of city, but they're building this whole city that they've developed for uh, entertainment. And um, I need photographers, I need producers, I need uh, people who have been, you know, kind of wined and dined. I'm not sure so much during COVID, but but certainly in the wake, you know, still in the time after Khashoggi was killed. And so it would be, it would be so much better if we they could just, we could all just move on from this one little lapse and human rights, it's very inconvenient. Well, it's not really a, a one little lapse. I mean, this is uh, a authoritarian regime that has tens of thousands of people sitting in their jails uh, for doing nothing more than sending a tweet uh, for or for making a comment not um, uh, in line with the vision or uh, or narrative of the kingdom. I mean, this is a country that has a, a long stretching record of human rights abuses. Uh, they beheaded some eight to 900 people last year. Most of these people that were beheaded um, were young uh, activists uh, that just had the audacity of saying something not in support of Mohammed bin Salman or the kingdom. So uh, this, is, this is a long stretching narrative um, and also in suppressing women's rights uh, as well. Uh, and the nature of that society. Um, but we've been willing to look the other way. Um, and many in Hollywood have been willing to look the other way as well because Saudi Arabia holds the world's largest sovereign wealth fund. They also are the, you know, the backer of SoftBank, the world's largest hedge fund. Um, and that money and investment um, has been so pervasive that um, it has led to myriads of media companies, uh, uh, Fortune 500 companies, and governments to essentially, you know, uh, look the other way to their human rights abuses because the money and the business interests uh, are just too powerful. Too powerful. Um, yes, and I have written about that. Um, I don't know if our viewers were trying to fix. I got a lot of since the sun just moved, so I hope you guys can still see me. Um, that's better. Thank you production team. Um, yes, and I have written about this. I, I uh, have uh, issues with Saudi Arabia's investment in media in Hollywood, um, and WME has given back money, the investment that they took uh, in the wake of Jamal's murder. But um, I do want to ask you about the journey of the film, because I have heard through the grapevine that you were having difficulties finding a distributor who was willing to upset Saudi Arabia by distributing your film. Is that true? Well, uh, the film premiered at, at Sundance, uh, this uh, in um, 
you know, uh, 2020, uh, the, uh, and the end of January, 2020. And, uh, uh, we had just a kind of an overwhelming, uh, positive response. We were met with standing ovations. Hillary Clinton was at our premiere, Alec Baldwin, uh, all sorts of others, um, received, uh, just wonderful, um, write-ups and, and reviews. Um, and then not a, uh, single major, uh, distributor or streamer step forward uh, to acquire the film uh, despite being listed on you know the all all the you know uh, lists that come out of, of Sundance um, and uh, Briarcliff Entertainment uh, Tom Ortenberg uh, did come forward Tom has uh, been a, a an advocate for his entire career for for tough films uh, he did crash. He did Spotlight, he did Fahrenheit 9-11, and the list goes on. Um, and, uh, and Tom and Briarcliff step, stepped forward to uh, distribute the film. We had planned to have it released October 2nd uh, with a pretty wide release in theaters and will now come out in limited theaters Christmas Day and then on all the on-demand platforms January 8th. Um, we also have quite a few foreign distributors lined up, notably Altitude in the UK, which is uh, wonderful, and Madman in Australia, and a variety of other distributors in Europe. But in terms of the matey major streamers uh, yeah. or studios, um, it was across the board um, fear, cowardice, uh, and protecting of their business interests, their subscriber growth, uh, or not wanting to upset the apple cart in that region. And just in the last few months, uh, Amazon uh, announced that they uh, acquired Souk in Saudi Arabia, uh, which is basically the Amazon of Saudi Arabia. So even despite everything you see in the film of Jeff Bezos's hack and that they killed, uh, you know, arguably an employee of Jeff Bezos, uh, Amazon is still doing business with Saudi Arabia. Netflix just announced uh, an eight picture deal uh, with the Saudi Arabian uh, production company, which is, you know, has to be involved uh, with the kingdom and the government because that's how it works there. Um, and uh, Netflix is clearly very uh, focused on growth in Saudi Arabia, having removed uh, Hassan Minaj's episode uh, about a year and a half ago that revolved uh, around the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. Um, you know, and, and this can be said of, of all of the major studios or, or streamers that, uh, that the appetite is for the money and the business interests, and that takes precedent over human rights. So um, I'm grateful to uh, Tom Mortenberg and Briarcliff that are going to give this film uh, life. Well, you just said a mouthful right there. I think uh, it, it's incredibly insidious how this um, money wields its way into an otherwise uh, free society, ours, I mean now, a democratic society um, and, and uh, 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 open commerce. And so I think it's really um, important for you to point those things out. It is a little bit shocking that Amazon would be doing uh, a big deal shocking maybe it's not shocking um uh in the film you reveal that jeff bezos met mbs uh mohammed bin salman the ruler of saudi arabia you have images of the texts they exchanged and then you also note chronologically by a, I guess it's an investigator from the un i maybe i have that wrong david k yes okay who is bringing as an independent observer saying that they've noted the an outpouring of data from Jeff Bezos's phone shortly after that happened. So, right. and, and let's also point out because none of us ever found out how this happened, that his affair, uh, you know, in his private life was, was uh, put in the national Enquirer with all of these photos of his personal life and every, and me as a journalist was, I, I broke my head trying to figure out how, who was, how did they get those photos? And that's still, we don't know, but it is all very, very suspicious. And it just goes from like the most, from the biggest deal of like a international crime 
to a, a personal affair on the page of the National Enquirer, which you could call trivial, but still look at how much it's, how insidious this, this is. Well, this was uh, Mohammed bin Salman, or, you know, uh, basically hacked Jeff Bezos in revenge for him owning the Washington Post. Because what, what's so hard, I think, for us in Western media to understand and, and what, or for Mohammed bin Salman to understand is just because somebody owns a newspaper doesn't mean that they control what the newspaper writes uh, in a world where you have free speech and free press. So in Mohammed bin Salman's estimation, because Jeff Bezos owned the Washington Post, that means that he could control what the Washington Post writes about. And the fact that the Washington Post had uh, covered Jamal's murder, had brought it to be front page news, had pushed the story forward across all other media outlets and newspapers and that he was a Washington Post journalist and that they kept at it. Uh, you know, I think MBS looked at it as like a, you know, as a personal affront to him, but it wasn't. It was simply, you know, a, a newspaper doing its job uh, in free press. Well, it but, the, but the hack of his phone, you know, is it shows that I mean, if you can hack the phone of the richest man in the world, I mean, who who can't you hack? Of a tech company. A tech company. A tech company. And, and, and I believe that that also was probably one of the uh, factors um, behind the distribution of the film. Because if you're a CEO of one of these major media companies, you're sitting there and going, well, look what they did to Jeff Bezos. I don't want them to do that to me. Um I mean, there's a similar story going on right now with Ryan White uh, and Assassins. Um, you know, Ryan did The Keepers. He just did this film about the murder of uh, of Kim Jong-un's brother uh, in Malaysia. Mm -hmm. And they, again, couldn't get uh, a major um, media partner, you know, studio streamer behind it uh, because of the lingering fear behind the Sony hack uh, involving the interviews. So... You know, we see business interests constantly um, to this day in this moment uh, trumping, for lack of a better word, uh, you know, stories involving human rights and free speech um, that we know that a global audience wants to learn about, but might not align uh, with those business interests uh, or security concerns. So there's an interesting conundrum, I think, when it comes to Saudi Arabia in some ways, because it's not just um, business interests, although I 100% agree and feel like we need more daylight around those relationships. But um, at the time uh, when I was writing about your film uh, and other, and I've written about Saudi Arabia before, it's a particular interest of mine, not just because of how they treat women. Um, and there is a uh, an activist who dared to drive her car, who is still... Uh, Lujan Hatul. Lujan Hatul. Al um, I mean, so that goes on. And she was briefly on hunger strike recently. And I'm in touch with um, women's groups that and journalist groups that want to support her. She's not, she's not a journalist. She's an activist. Mm, yeah, she's on, she's on trial right now. For driving her car. I mean, in Saudi Arabia, happens. yeah. That's really what she did. That's not. I know that's not the charge against her, but that's basically what she did, right? But at the, but at the same time, what I wanted to say is when I spoke to some some experts about in the Middle East and sort of tried to get a read on where should we be on Saudi Arabia, you know, the word came back is like there's their MBS has also open society quite a bit, um, and women now can drive despite putting this woman on trial. And there are, and he really does want to bring uh, cinema and live entertainment uh, and open up and, and, and help Saudi society progress beyond oil and become more open. There, it feels like there's some odd tension there. Yeah. Well, that's the irony of it. Um, Lujan Hatul basically drove before it was legal for women to drive because she was launching a social protest, you know, and saying that women in the country should be able to drive. Uh, then Mohammed bin Salman made it legal for women to drive, but because she drove before it was legal, she uh, is uh, has been arrested and has been an enemy of a government for basically speaking out. And torture. Um, 
and tortured. So, you know, so everything is on his terms, on his timeline. And, you know, and this was what Jamal was writing and advocating about. He was not saying, uh, let's overthrow the kingdom. Uh, there shouldn't be a monarchy. Uh, nor was he saying, I don't, uh, I don't like MBS. All that he was saying is that he believed that the rule of one man and one man's opinion alone is dangerous. And that in any society, all societies, you have to be open to other narratives, to other opinions. And that in the case of Saudi Arabia, he was simply saying that, you know, yes, many things that Mohammed bin Salman had been doing are positive for the country. But at the same time, he is repressing uh, any voice against him. And you can't be a great leader of reform and open up your society and at the same time arrest, jail, imprison, or behead anybody who dare speaks an opinion different from yours. And that is uh, the irony of, you know, of, of MBS and what is going on uh, in, in, in Saudi. It's really well put. So we're about to embark on a new presidency in this country uh, with a very different approach to governing and international relations. Joe Biden is a veteran of international affairs. His secretary of state is uh, somebody who's a centrist guy who I happen to know from my past years in reporting abroad and uh, very, very different from what we've seen. What do you think should be our, um, our approach to Saudi Arabia? And is there something more that we should be looking for in terms of uh, Jamal Khashoggi's murder um, with this new administration that's coming in? Um, well, uh, yeah, our, our conversation has turned very political outside of the, uh, of, uh, of the film. Uh, but, you know, look, in, 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 in making the film, uh, uh, you know, part of, part of making it became uh, being an activist. And uh, Hatija, in the months following Jamal's murder, once she was ready, uh, she wanted to come to Washington uh, to meet with senators and congressmen uh, and fight for justice for his murder. And uh, uh, I helped put that together for her, for her to come to Washington and take um, these meetings. And, and in being with her in Washington uh, during that week, um, you know, we met with so many senators and congressmen and there truly was bipartisan support ac across the aisle uh, to look deeper into the U.S. relationship with Saudi Arabia, uh, to impose sanctions upon Saudi Arabia, to block weapons sales, uh, to do what we could to stop the war in Yemen, um, and reassess that relationship and hold MBS accountable for Jamal's murder. Uh, what we then saw was that the Trump administration, despite what uh, both houses passed, Congress and the Senate, um, you know, or the House of Rep Representatives and the Senate's Senate passed, uh, Trump vetoed. Um, and in just even in the film, when you see anything critical of Trump, I was certain to make sure that it was Republicans voicing those opinions, opinions, Bob Corker, Rand Paul, Lindsey Graham, uh, so that the film never felt partisan because I certainly didn't want that. Um, and, uh, you know, but Biden put out a statement on October 2nd, on the second year anniversary of Jamal's death, uh, saying, you know, that he wants uh, justice for Jamal. He believes in holding Saudi Arabia accountable for this murder. And if elected president, uh, one of his uh, first things he will be doing is reassessing uh, the U.S.-Saudi relation relationship and, uh, and seeking uh, justice for Jamal. So... That's yet to be determined what happens, but there yep. appears to be uh, um, a desire, at least on behalf of the uh, incoming administration, uh, to have accountability for this crime and have accountability for Saudi Arabia's human rights abuses. Um, you know, just in, in a follow up to that, one of the things that the Trump Trump did was he pulled the United States off the human rights 
uh, committee at the United Nations. So while I was there with Hatizia at the UN, as Agnes Calamard was testifying about Jamal's murder, and as you see in the film, as Hatizia's testifying, the Saudi delegation gets up and leaves the room. Mm. The United States was not even there. Mm. We do not have a seat on the UN Human Rights Council uh, because uh, the Trump administration removed us. Uh, so, I mean, there's things like this that I think um, likely will change under the Biden administration, and the United States will hopefully take a more forward-facing role again uh, in defending human rights abuses. That's interesting. I, I was not aware that they that Biden has already expressed an opinion about about this. What to you, uh, given the circumstances as they are, uh, what does justice for Jamal, as you put it, what does that what does that mean at this point in time? Like what could be done now? Well, um, you know, look, uh, COVID has uh, uh, you know messed all of our lives up and has made so many issues like this fall on the back burner while we uh, combat a global pandemic uh, and the ravages uh, from that. Um, but it's my hope that uh, as the world hopefully moves beyond COVID and we're able to have a recovery, uh, that these kind of issues will uh, return to center stage. And I think what justice for Jamal means is it's not that MBS is going to step away from uh, his power, the throne. Um, it's it's not that his murders, are, his murderers, are truly going to be uh, accountable and be extradited to Turkey. I mean, none of that is realistic. But I think what is realistic is demanding the release of all of these political prisoners in Saudi Arabia, such as Lujan Al Hatul such as Omar Abdelaziz's brothers who sit in a Saudi jail having been tortured and without any charges against him for two years, his 33 friends, uh, Osama Zamal, the economist, Jamal's friend who was arrested and remains imprisoned simply for disagreeing with uh, Mohammed bin Salman's Vision 2030, an economic plan for the kingdom and and wanting to bring Saudi Aramco public, you know, things like this. There are thousands and thousands of people um, that deserve to be freed and let their voices heard. And I think that that is justice for uh, Jamal, um, uh, fighting to continue uh, to uh, stop these human rights abuses um, in the kingdom and let voices of dissent be heard. That I, I think is the most we can hope for uh, on top of sanctions and possibly reassessing our relationship because we don't really need Saudi oil. I mean, we have our own oil, we have electric. Um, and so our reliance uh, is more of a vestige from the past rather than looking at the now and the future. Well, I'm glad you pointed that out. That's very important uh, to note. They, they do wield an inordinate amount of power dating back to the time that we were all on uh, on oil. Um, there's other things that go on that have to do with regional counterbalances and Iran and, the, and, and all of that, which is more. Yeah, and Israel and, uh, and that they're become an ally of Israel uh, with the Emirates. Um, so it's just, there's so much uh, politics intertwined in this and that gets in the way um, when you have a country that has hundreds of billions, if not trillions, um, to invest, and they are using that money uh, to buy their way into uh, uh, Western society, whether that's, you know, the hundreds of millions that they invested in Live Nation or AMC or Penske Media or all of their investments into tech companies like Uber and all these other Silicon Valleys through the, through the hedge fund and the sovereign wealth fund. Um, you know, the the money is too big uh, for the vast majority of corporations, uh, companies, and governments to pass up that are that are selling weapons uh, to the, to the kingdom. Well, luckily, uh, none of that money succeeded in keeping you from making your film or getting it distributed. Uh, we're going to take some questions from our audience. 
Um, oh, I see. I guess they're ready to go. All right, we have one right there. Robert Trabor, thanks for thanks for joining us. What was your artistic and intellectual O uh, journey from Jutopia <laughs> along to that's a that's a, another film that you did to Icarus to the Dissidents? And then, out of luck, do you ever plan to do a comedy block? <laughs> that's uh, this, is, this is a great question. Um, for those that uh, don't don't know my past, um, I uh, uh, when I came to Los Angeles, um, uh, uh, I got into stand up comedy. Uh, I was doing stand up comedy. The stand up comedy turned into acting. The acting turned into writing, and I ended up uh, co writing a play called uh, Jutopia that was about a gentile guy that wanted to marry a jewish girl so he'd never have to make another decision and <laughs> at the time i i starred in the play i produced it um uh along with sam wolfson and um we played in la for a year and a half we spent three and a half years off broadway in new york and then i directed the feature film adaptation of uh of the play uh by the same name jutopia that had Rita Wilson in it, and Tom Arnold, and Jamie Lynn Siegler, and Peter Stormare, and uh, uh, a whole cast of uh, other wonderful comedic actors. Um, but that film actually um, landed me in what I would call director's jail. Um, our financier turned down distribution. It was looked at as a flop. And um, this was in 2012 uh then 2013 and it and it uh i was uh without work i was broke um and i was trying to figure out how i was going to reinvent um my career my, my life and uh, uh cycling was what i have always been passionate about as a hobby uh lance armstrong confessed in january 2013 and i got what became the idea uh, for Icarus, and um, that began the journey uh, of Icarus, um, that uh, you know led to the wonderful uh, uh, you know completion of that film and, and the accolades um, that then led to the dissident. Um, so it's been, I've I've had a very uh, kind of uh, strange and varied path um, in the entertainment business and in my uh, pursuit of filmmaking. So whether or not I would do a, a comedy doc, um, I guess it would be about uh, on who, um, but uh, I am working on uh, uh, two doc projects right now, one that is uh, highly political and follows the, the kind of same uh, impact of Icarus or the dissident. And I'm also working on a, on a music doc that I, um, I'm unable to discuss quite yet. Um, and also, uh, uh, on a, on a limited, uh, scripted series, which I'm unable to announce, but that's also very, uh, uh, politically, uh, based. But, uh, if you got the idea for the comedy doc, let me know. <laughs> I'll, I'll take yeah. a look. What, whatever you're working on in scripted, you really couldn't make up anything more outrageous than what happened in, in the in the dissident and the actual facts of life. I don't know that if you'd ever dare even try to pass that, make that believable. Um, okay, let's take another question. Here's an audience question. Okay, were there moments either during or after filming that you personally feared for your safety? covering this story. That also came up during Icarus too, but totally valid on this one as well. Yeah, question, question. you know, uh, uh, it, it's um, funny as in the word, it's uh, kind of sad. I mean, that every every single event that I did around Icarus and screenings, that generally was the very first question I was always asked. Are you uh, in fear of your life? Has Russia made any attacks against you? Have you uh, heard from Russian agents? Are you, you know, are you fearful? And this is again the question that I'm getting with the dissident, um, and um, I I personally have not been threatened. Um, I don't believe if I was under threat that I would know until I <laughs> until it was too late. But you know, um, 
I, I, I think that I, I, when I'm making films like this and the dissident, um, I become so personally invested emotionally in what these people, what these victims are going through um, and the need to bring a story like this forward that, um, that I, I don't think really about myself from my own personal um, safety. Cause I think um, fear is what stops uh, so many of us from doing things or taking action or otherwise um, uh, speaking our opinion or minds about things. Cause we're always worried about what might happen or, or the variable. And if you look at Hatija Jangas, I mean, here is a woman that uh, was a, a writer uh, on on Oman, uh, was seeking uh, to be a journalist, um, and yet in the aftermath of Jamal's murder, I mean, she could have just cowered and went, you know, back, you know, into her quiet life and pretended that this didn't happen and move on. But for two years now, she has become Jamal's voice, um, and that to me is is, you know, uh, is, is not only brave, it's, it's an example of, of how to lead. Um, and I look at Agnes Calamar, the UN Special Repertoire, yeah. uh, who, who also is, uh, spoke fearlessly. So, you know, I look to women like this and people like this that, that show bravery in the face of adversity. And I just kind of try to stay focused on, um, on doing my, best job that I can as a filmmaker and a storyteller and not get too worried about um, the if then variables that are really beyond my control. Um, what I can control is, is the stories that I tell um, and what time that I have on this earth and what I want to spend my life doing. And I'm very proud to be able to uh, have you have the backing um, to make films like this? Great question and, and great answer. You know, it's, it's uh, they count on people who do the bad things. They count on people being afraid to speak up. And it really just reminds you why the Jamal Khashoggi's are so important, why our documentary filmmakers are so important why our storytellers in Hollywood are so important. There's a lot of truth that gets told in fiction as well, as we know. So um, fears, fears the, fear is the, is the enemy of, of truth, really. I think it's fair to say. Um, let, let's it really take, is. Yeah. Let's uh, take a question. Uh, Abhishek Daryawan, thank you for joining us. Do you think the release of this film will restart a conversation about human rights violations, or is it just going to be reminiscent of what went down? I think that is a very good question. And I think the answer to that lies in uh, hopefully all of the tens of thousands, millions of people around the world that hopefully will see this film. And, um, uh, the Human Rights Foundation um, backed this film. I, I couldn't have made this film without Thor Halverson uh, and the Human Rights Foundation. And um, long story short is when I um, set out to begin this journey of making The Dissident, um, I got connected uh, to Thor. Um, and uh, the Human Rights Th Foundation runs the Oslo Freedom Forums, uh, <clears throat> which they host every May in Oslo. Uh, and they bring dissidents from all over the world in uh, to speak about what is happening uh, in their countries, what human rights abuses are happening in their countries. And pretty much anyone uh, is welcome at uh, the Oslo Freedom Forum. And they host one in Taiwan, they host one in Mexico and New York, but the big ones in Oslo. And this is what the Human Rights Foundation uh, puts together. Um, and they had Jamal. Uh, speak, not, he didn't speak, he attended in May of 2018. Um, and Iyad al-Baghdadi, who appears in the film, who's an Emirati uh, dissident and has become a vocal Saudi dissident and was friends with Jamal, uh, actually brought Jamal there. And so as I went to go make this film, I, I meet Thor and 
Thor and I talk about it. And Thor also uh, had already been in, uh, had already reached out to Omar uh, Abdulaziz. And Thor said, look, this, what you're doing and what you did with Icarus, but what you want to do in the story of Jamal aligns perfectly with our foundation mm -hmm. and what we are advocating for. And uh, we would like to uh, help you make this film and produce the film with you. Um, and so literally the film was 100% financed uh, by the Human Rights Foundation, uh, which is unbelievable and extraordinary. I mean, this film was basically made 100% through charitable donations. Wow. Um, and then when uh, we didn't have a big sale um, uh, at Sundance and we didn't have a, a sale, uh, the Human Rights Foundation doubled down and raised more money behind the uh, PNA uh, to market and uh, promote the film and advertise the film and to bring it forward. So I am so humbly uh, grateful to them and uh, uh, and Thor Halverson, Gary Kasparov is their CEO. Uh, and none of this would be happening if it wasn't for uh, charitable donations of people um, that uh, have come behind the Human Rights Foundation to help bring this story to the world. Um, so I tell that story because that story um, aligns with your question, which is, do you think this will reignite a conversation? And that is in the hands of individuals. It's in the hands of hopefully the millions of people that will see this film. And just like the Arab Spring happened, just like the Black Lives Movement, Black Lives Matter happened movement, just like Me Too movement happened, all these grew from angst through people's opinions, through, uh, through people wanting to share what was going on in their worlds and take action. And I think that this film can do that, but it's up to people to take those reins and ask their, their governments to hold Saudi Arabia accountable, to ask their leaders to hold uh, the kingdom accountable uh, and mandate uh, that, that, you know, these, uh, uh, that these concerns are met. And this also has to do with, you know, uh, uh, turning an eye to these media companies uh, and big businesses uh, that are willing to look the way at, about a murder as horrific as this uh, in exchange for subscriber growth uh, or their business interests in the kingdom. Beautiful. I did not know that about the Human Rights Foundation. That's I've never heard of that actually before behind uh, a documentary. That's amazing. Um, we're almost out of time. I can take one more question and I, and I think we're going to have to wrap. Do we have another question? Ew. How has covering the story affected you personally after this film? Um, you know, when you go through something like this, um, you know, I, uh, I basically spent all of 2019 uh, uh, with uh, Jake Swanko, my producing partner and cinematographer uh, in Istanbul uh, uh, shooting. Uh, I spent seven months in Istanbul, about four months in Montreal, and then was with Atesia in Washington, New York, London, uh, Geneva, back and forth to Ankara. Um, it was, uh, it was emotionally, uh, draining and exhausting, uh, making this film because, uh, part of this is you become involved in these people's lives. And to me, Hatija's uh, a sister to me now, Omar's a brother. Um, I, 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 I love these people. And, um, uh, and I fell in love with Jamal in making this film. Um, and so, you know, it, it really is emotionally draining when you see the actions of, of, uh, of our government and the Trump administration, um, and Bob Woodard's book. I mean, he's on tape saying I saved MBS's ass and he's proud of that. Uh, he's proud that he, uh, was basically able to help MBS cover up this crime. Um, you know, you, 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 it's hard not to become emotionally invested. And, um, and I wanted, uh, and I thought better of so many um, uh, companies and corporations that I have now learned uh, 
don't hold my beliefs, don't hold my interests in being an activist. And um, it's certainly been emotionally draining, but it's also been inspiring because the film is going to have a release because there are Tom Ortenbergs in the world that uh, that are willing to give this film a life and to get it be seen. And I believe that change can can come and, and, and you see it. I mean, just in Hatizia, uh, when I met her, she didn't speak a word of English. She's now fluent in English. Oh. And, and she's committed her life to fighting uh, for human rights and justice for the man that she loves. Um, and so, you know, uh, uh, these, this, this emotional um, kind of journey that I've been on, um, there's also been a lot of happiness in it also um, because uh, I feel proud of the film and I feel proud to uh, get to know people like Atija, to get to know people like Omar, uh, to get to be in situations where you get to meet people that um, go through great loss, but also are able to fight through it and make change. And, uh, and that's a real honor for me as a filmmaker. Um, and also getting to work with the, my creative team and people like Thor Halverson and Mark Monroe and Jake Swanko and my editors and creative partners that share um, those ideals that I do and getting to collaborate uh, and make something that um, becomes art, but it also uh, uh, becomes a story of truth. And hopefully the combination of those two elements uh, can lead to change. That's really great. Brian, thank you so much for being here, for showing us your film, and for, for being so uh, vulnerable with us today and so open and honest. Uh, it's, uh, it's a journey to make this film. It's another kind of journey to go back through it and talk about all of the, all of the things that it raises that are difficult but important if we are determined to live in a free society and see that free society um, happen elsewhere for those who demand those rights and deserve them, frankly. So um, we've got work to do <laughs> in our world. Um, and thank you for doing the work that you've done. Thank you for joining us here today. I encourage everybody to go see the film if you didn't uh, get to see it in the that we sent out. You can see it in theaters on December 25th and on streaming services after that. Um, thank you all for being here. Uh, if you want to sign up for more screenings in our screening series, you can check out uh, Rap Pro. If you sign up for Rap Pro, which is a free seven day uh, trial, you will automatically be invited to these screenings and um, look forward to many more fascinating conversations with other talented filmmakers. But for today, thank you so much, Brian. And yeah, thank, thank you, Sharon. And uh... Uh, really appreciate uh, having a platform to speak and hope you'll all see The Dissident and uh, it'll be available on all uh, on demand uh, uh, where you can rent a movie on January 8th and uh, uh, 